Thing at the Hunter College MFA Studio Art Program. And for the first MFA student organization lecture series to be held entirely online. <laughs> for those of you who aren't Hunter students, Mofaso offers up to nine free public lectures every semester, as well as our twice yearly open studios and affordable art auction, currently on hold due to global pandemic. You can always see upcoming events on the department website and we announce them on the Mofaso Instagram account, both which I'll post in the chat right now. Boop. And then um, I'm also posting a link to the Mofaso PayPal account if you'd like to support the program and lecture series through a small donation. And we will have a Q&A at the end facilitated by me. Um, so please feel free to write your questions in the chat during the lecture or when it's time for Q&A, you can just, we can take questions by video chat and more on that later, how to do that. Um, but to introduce our guest, Stephanie Siuko works in photography, sculpture and installation, moving from handmade and craft inspired mediums to digital editing and archive excavations. Using critical wit and collaborative co-creation, her projects leverage open source systems, shareware logic, and flows of capital in order to investigate issues of economies and empire. Recently, she has focused on how photography and image-based processes are implicated in the construction of racialized exclusionary narratives of history and citizenship. For the year of 2019-2020, she is a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow at the National Museum of Amer- <gasps> My cat jumped up next to me, I'm so sorry. <gasps> she is she is a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow at the. <laughs> uh oh. She is a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow at the National Museum of American History in Washington D.C. She is featured in season nine of the acclaimed PBS documentary series Art Twenty One, Art in the Twenty First Century. Recent exhibitions include being New Photography at the Museum of Modern Art New York, Public Knowledge at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Stephanie Siuko Rogue States at the Contemporary Art Museum uh, St. Louis, and Disrupting Craft, the 2018 Renwick Invitational at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Born in the Philippines in 1974, Siuko received her MFA from Stanford University and BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. Oh, she is the recipient of a 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship Award, a 2009 Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Award, and a 2020 Tiffany Foundation Award. Her work has been exhibited widely, including at MoMA PS1, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, ZKM Center for Art and Technology, the California Biennial at the Orange County Museum of Art, the 12th Havana Biennial, the 2015 Asian Art Biennial at Taiwan, among others. A longtime educator, she is an associate professor in sculpture at the University of California, Berkeley. She lives in Oakland, California. So uh, without further, further ado, I, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce Stephanie Siuko. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Ting. That was great. And I love that your um, that the cat made its amazing in entryway into your screen. That was actually that that's a great way to kick it off because this is going to be all about the ways in which imaging technologies betray reality. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully this works. Uh, view presents. All right. So you tell me, does this look good, everybody? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Just want to make sure that this screen is up. So um, I am going to, uh, I do have a title for my talk. I'm also going to try to keep it to about 45 minutes, which unfortunately might be a little bit of a challenge because usually I structure these as hour long talks, but in order to kind of to take the question answer session afterwards, I'm going to try to condense. So if for some reason it seems like I'm moving really fast or I decide to kind of skip ahead on a project, just bear with me. But first of all, I just want to say um, thank you to the Hunter 
your MFA program for having me. I know I'm the first in, a, in your series and things have changed so quickly for you in terms of how you've had to navigate your MFA. And I completely feel for you because as a professor, I'm also having to kind of, you know, deal with and go through these issues also with um, my own teaching uh, when it starts up in the fall. But um, anyway, back to the, uh, the talk at hand. So um, the talk is called Insert, Duplicate, Delete on the Politics of Imaging and Representation. And um, I also added just a little sort of pronunciation uh, um, uh, a line at the bottom. Uh, my last name is Sihuko, which is often um, uh, mis, uh, uh, mispronounced, but I actually answer to almost any pronunciation of it. Um, so, the reason I decided to focus on imaging isn't because that's necessarily what my previous work has been about. Um, and this is a kind of uh, sort of visual snapshot of some of the larger installations that I've done in the past. And usually I create large scale, um, what I call large scale spectacles of objects, which are uh, sometimes collaboratively or collectively produced and then um, distributed or somehow interfaced with the public. Um, I also um, have been interested in kind of uh, navigating lots of different fields. So this is a, a kind of almost like a like a word cloud of some of the areas in which I've really tried to focus in on. And specifically, you know, sculpture is really in the center because for me, you know, returning back to the object seems to be something that, you know, I, I have a tendency to um, to go back to. But with that, you know, the fields also of social practice, public pedagogy, uh, creating print and publications, uh, networks and platforms, running workshops, going into new media and digital 3D objects, as well as uh, I'm more recently known now for uh, photography and installations, um, as well as video, textiles and craft. So I like to show this just because I feel like um, you know, the, the fields are so open these days. And um, even though I do go into these other territories, it does, I think, for me, uh, relate back to the object in many ways. I also like to think about how my work is um, distributed and in what sorts of arenas it's, um, uh, it navigates through. So again, this is not a, a definitive sort of Venn diagram, but I loosely see the three kind of constellations that my work circulates in is, you know, one being the art world, and that's the kind of, you know, traditional sort of models of the studio, the gallery, the museum, the kind of things we associate with, you know, a very sort of professional art world. And then of course, the larger public, which, you know, is not separate from it, but has a tendency to interface in different ways. And that's with the responsibilities that go along with it in terms of, um, you know, thinking about society, citizenship, public life in the greater community. And then, of course, there's the academy, which is the school or the institution. And that's a, that's also one of the arenas in which I spend a lot of my time in as a full time professor at UC Berkeley. Um, and, and again, you know, to sort of keep rooting it into this uh, notion of objecthood and making. Um, I really am fascinated by the, the word fabricate, which if you think about the root word, um, you know, it's, it has three main definitions. Um, the first is pretty straightforward, which is to make, build, or construct. The second, which is to devise, invent, or concoct, as in create a story or a lie. And then the third, definition is to fake or forge. And so within that word itself, um, you have this, you know, uh, kind of complication of what it means to actually make or construct something. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot too about the physicalness of these constructions and specifically in photography and the world of post-production of digital imaging, you know, there's an entire apparatus built around uh, making something appear as if it's something else or dropping something in or even removing something. So the notion of deleting or substituting or inserting you know, it has come to play in my work. And, you know, just to point out too, you, the funny thing about my background right now is that it is a, um, it's a, uh, 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 what is it? It's a digital representation of an illustration of a um, green screen production studio that's actually on a physical green screen behind me. So, you know, these multiple levels of sort of uh, construction. And again, you know, before I launch into the work, just some more background. Um, I'm going to this image, this very early photograph that was taken of uh, myself and my mother when I was four years old um, at Disneyland. 
So uh, when my mother and myself immigrated to the United States from the Philippines in 1978, uh, she took me to Disneyland for my uh, fourth birthday. And we took this portrait in, uh, I guess, what is ref referred to as sort of like frontier land or you know, the, the Wild West area of, of Disneyland. And they have these portrait studios where you can dress up in period costume and also you know, kind of pose as a uh, like a pioneer or a kind of new American. And looking back at this photograph, it's made me think a lot about what it means to construct oneself as an immigrant and how one also attempts to create, you know, connections between an American history that in many times has sort of um, positioned itself as exclusionary, especially to Asian Americans. And what this image means in, in thinking about how, you know, my mother herself was attempting to become, you know, a new American. So I think my mother might actually be joining online, which is really wonderful and viewing from the Philippines. So if she's here, hi, mom. Um, so one of the, my early explorations in uh, this notion also of circulation and um, image production was um, in 2003, when I think that, you know, the internet was still a, a fairly newish place for most people, um, stock photo sites started popping up in which people could upload for free their images in order to kind of add to a free database. And so I decided to uh, do a test by, I uploaded a single image of myself, and you can see this is in 2003, to the uh, website Stock Exchange, and just captioned it, kissing air, and then over the year, track where it would be used. And what's interesting is through Google image search, you can do a reverse lookup. And what I've found is over the last, I guess, 18 years now, the image of myself has been used in many ways in which I've been completely out of control of, of its, um, uh, of its uh, use. So uh, one of the, I've highlighted some of the more interesting ones. Um, in particular, this is myself advertising on a Christian uh, website. Uh, well, actually very critical of the notion that sex sells. And there I am and, uh, you know, talking critically uh, or illustrating critically how bad it is. Um, oh. And then, uh, of course, the, um, the Filipina site. This is the Christian dating website in which I myself am the, uh, I guess, the, the Filipina to date. Um, there's also the romance advice site in which um, I am a, uh, what is it? Oh, I, the happy love story, the gayltr.com. So, hi, my name is Julia, and I wanted to say thank you to you for your wonderful advice site. And so I guess I'm also either I'm Julia or maybe I'm the person that um, has been found. Uh, and what's interesting too about these, uh, these free stock sites is that they share with each other. And so just uploading that single image meant that it actually proliferated across the internet and across other free sharing uh, stock photo sites. So here I am also in the kind of context of, um, the, uh, of other images. Um, this is me advertising Japan's new kissing machine for that long distance smooch in Weird Asian News. Um, and then also really odd things like here I am on a New Zealand uh, uh, tourism website where you can see me in the top right corner along with beaches and happy people uh, playing in New Zealand. Um, this is also me. I'm Lily Chen. So I've been also harvested as kind of fake avatars for um, other people's uh, uh, profiles, and I'm 24 years old in New York, New York. Um, there's a little bit more about uh, myself as Lily as well. And then I've also been really popular in Poland for some reason. So this is myself uh, on a kind of website in which you can replace my image with your own in order to have them printed on different things like greeting cards or mugs. Um, and then here's myself and my uh, Italian boyfriend. Anyway, it goes on and on. And, you know, the, I think for me too, what was interesting to find out was, you know, the, the assumption of who this person was, this young Asian woman. Um, here I am in a, a advertising a massage parlor in Rotterdam. So there's this, uh, you know, while it's entertaining at the same time, it's also disturbing to see, you know, what the assumptions are of someone who, either looks like me or what this image functions as completely apart and uh, separate from me. 
So in thinking too about, I guess, myself as a quote unquote Asian American and my own um, uh, representation in the American public imagination. Um, I grew up in San Francisco and we have the Asian Art Museum, which is a, a beautiful museum and it focuses on uh, mostly Asian antiquities. And growing up and visiting it, it felt somehow I really was trying to figure out my own uh, connection to a place called the Asian Art Museum. And it was quite difficult because in the antiquities, it felt like a kind of um, you know, space that was uh, frozen in time and didn't really speak to me. It was almost like a collection for, you know, of empire, a collection for others in which I was simply a, an observer. And around the time uh, that I started doing the, um, the stock photo project, um, I noticed that the Asian Art Museum had started to uh, put its uh, um, collection online. And so I, I was looking specifically at uh, vases and ceramic uh, porcelain objects. And I, was, I collected as many uh, objects as I could online in their database downloaded the photographs of the object, the tiny little JPEG, blew it up to the size that it was listed in, uh, in its uh, museum uh, uh, catalog, and then uh, printed it as a photograph and then adhered it on top of a laser jet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a laser uh, a cutter, a laser cutout, a wooden laser cutout. So what you're seeing here is a project called Raiders, uh, in which I've literally raided from the Asian Art Museum its collection of a kind of pan-Asian selection of uh, valuable objects. And if you walk uh, uh, around it, you'll notice, you notice that it's flat fronted and it sort of betrays its reality by being merely a prop in the construction of Asia. And so, you know, going further on that and actually skipping ahead quite a bit, um, Around the uh, 2011, 2012, I started uh, to become really fascinated by a, a, um, a, a phenomena known as cargo cults. Uh, and this is pulled directly from Wikipedia. And it was essentially a Melanesian millenarian movement, which uh, uh, encompassed a diverse range of practices and occurring in the wake of contact with the commercial networks of colonizing societies. So during, um, you know, between the periods of World War I and World War II, islands in the Pacific were coming into more contact with quote unquote outside um, societies. And they were creating entire um, uh, religions based on some of the new objects that were brought to them. And this was uh, fraught in many ways, but it was this sort of um, really interesting friction of this point of contact between a so-called, you know, kind of isolated culture and the, the, the larger so-called Western culture. And in thinking about cargo cults, um, I also uh, dis, uh, became really fascinated with this so-called discovery of a Stone Age tribe in the Philippines. And this was something that was highly touted in the 1970s. This was featured all over National Geographic. It had a uh, whole uh, coffee table books written about it and you know, news specials. And it was uh, essentially disproven uh, later as a, as a hoax. And it's more complicated than that, except that what fascinated me more than the reality of the Stone Age tribe or not, was more of how the larger Western world ate up the idea and wanted to see and wanted to construct this sort of uh, romantic native other. And some of the images that were, um, you know, very much in the forefront were of these, you know, incredibly, uh, what is it, innocent uh, people who, you know, were uh, apart from the larger Western world and uh, were needed to be left uncorrupt and untouched. And thinking too about the kind of paternalism in which the Philippines has always existed under as a colonial um, entity of both America and also uh, Europe and Spain, you know, this type of uh, visible construction was very important for, you know, keeping everyone in, in their place. Um, and mixing it all with, um, you know, thinking about uh, this uh, phenomena, visual phenomena called dazzle camouflage. And around World War I, uh, American and British battleships were decorating the sides of their, um, uh, were, dec were patterning themselves with this very disruptive black and white patterning in order to avoid enemy aim. So this didn't really function as camouflage as much as it did 
uh, in terms of disorienting the viewer so that they couldn't quite tell what they were looking at or what where uh, to aim in order to sink the ship. So this kind of mix, you know, I'm thinking about all these things, piling it all, all on, as well as looking at the time at uh, a whole series of kind of black and white fashion uh, patterns that were becoming really popular. And these are sort of these fake, uh, fake tribal and fake ethnic patterns. Um, this all converged into a project uh, I did in 2013 called Cargo Cults. Um, this is one of a series of four different images. And essentially, it, they are studio portraits using mass manufactured goods purchased from and returned to The Gap, Banana Republic, Forever 21, Charlotte Russe, H&M, American Apparel, Urban Outfit, Target, Radio Shack, and others. So at the time, I was doing a, an artist residency in, uh, at the Bemis Center in Omaha, Nebraska, which you know is like in the exact middle of America almost, but very, very far from say a, ver a foreign or exotic place. And I was going to shopping malls, purchasing um, clothing that sort of hinted at, you know, this ethnic other, buying everything on credit card, taking the clothes and props back to my studio, styling them to sort of reproduce what I uh, knew as ethnographic images of Filipino uh, tribes people. And then after the photo shoots, returning them to the store for full credit. So this sort of cycling through, um, you know, the, I, the desire of both purchasing the objects as well as buying into the idea of this exotic fantasy, but then at the same time denying it by, you know, returning the goods afterwards was a large part of the project. So uh, Cargo Cults, uh, this is a Basket Woman. And you know you can see they're they're quite large photographs actually. So when you see them in real life, um, you'll also notice that I had to leave on all the price tags and all the um, the the shopping labels because in order to return it uh, for the you know the refund, I, I I couldn't remove the tags. So looking really closely, you know you'll notice uh, uh, price tags. Um, there's also, uh, I can pick apart some of the things here. This is a Java bunny and on top of my head is a, uh, a black cheerleading pom-pom. There's a, 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 a target sock around my arm, uh, a gap belt around my neck, and then I think like an, uh, a USB cable wrapped around my arm as well. And then all the backdrops were printed using an eight and a half by 11 inkjet printer in which I was just uh, printing out and then tiling together and blowing up images also downloaded from the internet and also uh, using scrap fabric purchased from Joanne Fabrics. So, you know, the, the, the point of cargo culture is really to also show this, um, you know, this, the, the, I guess, a variety of, uh, of presentations and a variety of ways in which the other is constructed. Um, when thinking specifically about the Philippines, which is composed of uh, over uh, of thousands of islands and many, many different peoples and cultures within a single country, um, you know, that the sort of uh, the, the diversity of representation was also something that I, I wanted to show off. Um, but, you know, the but punctuating these images were also a lot of um, uh, these uh, black and white color charts. And in this case, um, you know, this chart actually tries to interrupt the image by uh, positioning it right in the middle. And these reference, you know, correct uh, photo exposure charts, the kinds of grayscale charts that a traditional photographer uses in order to, you know, create the, the perfect image. And along with these, uh, along with the series was a much tinier series um, called applicant photos. And these were done very quickly using, you know, a camera phone selfie. And the actual size of the photos are uh, passport sized. So, you know, what you're seeing right now on your screen is probably much larger than the actual image. And I was thinking a lot at the time of how, um, you know, as uh, as refugee uh, as the refugee crisis in Europe, as well as globally, has expanded, the public perception and idea of who a migrant or refugee is has kind of flattened out. Um, you know, the 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 mass of people that the media usually represents are um, are not rendered as individuals as much as they are rendered as a type or as a kind of you know group of people in a predicament. 
And so, you know, by covering the faces, it was a way to, um, and, and repatterning them uh, was a way to also suggest of uh, what the media was actually doing to obscure, you know, the stories of people. And it, it, for me, it also kind of brought forward a little bit more of, you know, the political moment where with cargo cults, I think it was looking, you know, a little backwards in terms of thinking about the history of colonialism. So now how can we, you know, bring that forward and talk about what's happening in, in present day uh, boundary making? And, you know, so moving forward and thinking also a little more about photography, um, this is a, a hilarious uh, color calibration chart that I used to look at a lot when I uh, used to work as a graphic designer in uh, the 1990s. And uh, back then, you know, you had these charts that you were attempting to kind of make sure that your screen was the same color as, and this was the chart that was given to me. So, you know, this kind of faux fake Carmen Miranda Adobe chart in which you can see, you know, fruit on her head, Adobe up on top, and then the, um, you know, the color bars on the side. And this trope keeps coming up over and over in terms of looking and correcting and when one thinks about how ethnicity is also kind of turned into a character in relationship to how we, we look at photography, you know, this is a perfect early example. And, you know, this also runs uh, in line with, you know, the idea of what are known as Shirley cards, which are, it's always, it's a woman usually who's in the, in the shot and sometimes surrounded by objects that help to kind of, you know, create the setting or the color around her. But they're very, they're, they're, they're either very idealized images or they're completely randomized images. I mean, it's almost a kind of clusterfuck of things. And, you know, if you look at the ways also that skin tones are supposed to be represented or shown, there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, I guess, stereotypical or distilled ways of, you know, creating these separations. Um, this is a German uh, a color calibration chart, again, showing, you know, three wonderful, differently uh, colored people. Um, and so that this, looking at these, uh, these images um, uh, uh, went, it inspired me to create a large scale installation called Neutral Calibration Studies, Ornament and Crime. And this is from 2016. And this was the first uh, project I did in which I was creating these large scale tableaus, mostly downloading images off the internet. And then again, printing them at, you know, 100% size, mounting them on cutouts, and then mixing them in a kind of um, sort of like a real, uh, like a still life. So if we cycle through um, some of the things on this platform, uh, there's a mix of references. There's some art objects downloaded from the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. There are objects pulled off of eBay. There's images um, also that reference the early days of internet photography. Um, and then there's objects that are spray painted gray. Oh, going back, objects spray painted neutral gray to also kind of um, uh, sort of both to neutralize them and also hint at this notion of an invisible, um, an invisible layer. So what we're looking at here is actually one of the first uh, JPEG images that ever circulated and her name was Lena. And it turns out Lena was chosen from a, uh, a either a penthouse or a Playboy magazine. And uh, chosen as a as the first uh, image to turn into a JPEG and send online, and so that that again you know uh, points in the direction of you know the ha, the basis of how photography has always been a kind of gendered and racialized space. Um, there, along uh, with the objects from uh, the Museum of Modern Art, there were also uh, samples pulled from Freud's Vienna study. Uh, different antiquities, um, fruit, because, you know, fruit uh, and still lifes uh, turn up a lot also in, in the color correction charts. And uh, these are uh, uh, from Freud's study. These are um, uh, Egyptian and other um, artifacts that Freud would actually pull out and use during his analysis uh, with uh, clients in which he would then um, encourage them to kind of project their own fantasies on top of these. And then thus he was given uh, content to analyze. Um, this one is, I think, a hilarious uh, um, 
uh, color chart. Again, using, you know, this wonderful triumvirate of, you know, the three different um, ethnic types and, you know, specifically over ethnicized in the middle image and then on the right, oh, I'm sorry, on the left, the kind of, you know, 80s uh, power woman version. And, you know, in the mix also were, um, you know, stock photos uh, directly pulled with the watermarks, in this case, you know, digital camouflage. There were also images of the Tasadai tribe in there, uh, specifically images of Tasadai taking photographs, which was really, you know, interesting to me, like the, the kind of flip of who's, who's photographing who. And uh, also peppering it were um, images of uh, Huey Newton from the Black Panthers, and it turns out that the seat that he's uh, very well known for sitting at is a traditional Filipino rattan chair. So, you know, this, this kind of converging also of um, references and histories. Um, and then you walk around to the back of the installation and realize that the whole thing is a complete setup. It's, you know, it's, it's like a stage or a prop. And uh, I also peppered it with um, objects, uh, fake ethnic objects, uh, tourist tchotchkes uh, purchased on eBay and then painted uh, neutral gray. And then hanging behind the whole thing was a giant 12 foot color calibration chart that was meant to kind of uh, drape loosely and droop in a kind of uh, imperfect backdrop for the whole work. So, you know, again, thinking about, um, I guess, all the ways in which uh, images are carried forward, in which they circulate, and also in which they're manipulated, literally, in terms of post-production, you know, two of the main, um, you know, contemporary sort of visuals associated with that right now is the chroma key green backdrop, as well as the Photoshop transparency layer. And so for those that are familiar with digital editing, the Photoshop transparency layer is the very last layer that you're not supposed to see, but tells you that, you know, you've reached the end. And in both the cases of the chroma key and the transparency layer, what strikes me as uh, being really um, interesting is that they're highly visible. So the, the notion of invisibility in thinking about these things um, is very contradictory and, um, you know, really kind of fights against the notion of, of not seeing it. Um, more recently, uh, since the 2016 presidential election, my work has really shifted towards um, looking less, I guess, at, uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, historical notions of uh, inequity and thinking more about contemporary protest movements. So, um, you know, thinking about ACT UP, uh, in, which was uh, the, from the 1980s and very active uh, when I was growing up as a, as a young girl in San Francisco. Um, as well as seeing campaigns like this of Grand Fury in the 1980s. I was, and, and also the Black Lives Matter movement, which has taken center stage today. And, you know, since its founding has really, um, you know, created amazing um, entries and possibilities for how we rethink and restructure our world and our lives. Um, so in 2017, the other thing that I was really witness to was um, a kind of white supremacist takeover of the UC Berkeley campus. And this was directly after the presidential election. And, you know, this happened in multiple campuses across the country, but, you know, Berkeley was heavily targeted. And uh, when I witnessed the protests, I also, when I witnessed, uh, it was really interesting to also witness the counter protests because um, you know the the, the visibility of um, the the anti-fascist movement as well as you know the um, the desire to show up was very uh, was was inspiring and very prominent and so in witnessing this I also um, realized that certain um, uh, certain banners would make appearances and reappearances. And in particular, this one struck me, which um, uh, says become ungovernable. And these are images downloaded from different news sources. And you can see how, you know, it's being used in, in uh, related but different protests. And in thinking too about how to literally, you know, um, not translate, but process some of the, um, the media manipulation that was happening around these protests um, and, and, and work with it as imagery in my art. Um, 
I became fascinated by how no matter what story was told about the protests, the media would have it would um, would spin it in whatever way it it uh, needed to go, and so that malleability and the uncontrollability of of the messaging that was going out was um, was, was something that uh, to reconcile with. And so one of the first ways that I processed it was through a, um, an exhibition at Ryan Lee Gallery in New York called Citizens. And it takes uh, three versions of the Become Ungovernable uh, banner and uh, turns it into um, a, a kind of fabric cutout. And so these are hand sewn and they're literally cut out of the JPEGs that I downloaded from the news sources. And you can also see the, um, where the heads of the people holding it have been removed. And essentially the banner has, become, has been rendered illegible um, mostly because of the way that the photo itself had you know, uh, shot the text. But it was really a nod towards the ways in which, you know, through that media processing, even the notion of, um, you know, resistance uh, was being um, was being uh, both fragmented, but also distorted uh, to the point where, um, you know, the message wasn't coming through. And along with the installation were a series of photographs uh, that uh, I staged and I worked with um, UC Berkeley students who um, uh, were also witness to the protests, but were not involved in the protest. And I wanted to create portraits of some of the protesters we witnessed, but do so in a way that also shielded them. So using the Berkeley students as stand-ins, we created composite uh, um, sort of uh, portraits of the protesters. And so this is um, Citizen Portrait of P. And all the students I worked with also identified with um, with groups that were being um, that were being under attack by the Trump administration, and so you know that self identification I think was very important to also um, uh, kind of assist in the um, this uh, interpretation. So this is citizen portrait of R, uh, citizen portrait of S, uh, citizen portrait of B. Because at the same time, you know, there, because of doxing issues, um, one shouldn't really um, show images of protesters in ways that's recognizable. So creating this kind of screen and using stand-ins for, for the protesters was also a way to um, still give them a stage, but to not, uh, um, to not uncover their, um, their identities. And so behind the entire installation was a project, uh, a, a large, uh, uh, I guess uh, it's a textile piece. It's almost like a sewn, uh, it's, it's almost like a giant quilt, but it's literally a, uh, a physical um, sewn uh, transparency backdrop uh, made out of two inch by two inch squares, but 26 feet by 13 feet wide and appearing as if it's sort of digitally disintegrating at the bottom. So the reason that, um, well, this is the, the backside of it, the reason I wanted to create this incredibly handmade process along with the digital imaging was to really stress this notion too that, um, you know, that these are massive constructions. The, the, um, the, the digital kind of, um, the mediated image, the newscasting, the kind of spin around it are not, um, they're not without uh, um, total kind of fabrication around it. And so by melding both the you know the incredibly crafted with the highly digital i was hoping that you know that metaphor could uh could push forward um so i just realized i have um i'm kind of running out of time so i'm gonna sort of speed it up and i'll, I'll probably actually i think i'm gonna cut it off early which is a little unfortunate but again i'm, I'm sorry to not um to uh, not have condensed a little better uh the along with that uh project um, you know, in 2017, you know, we were dealing uh, directly with the results of the presidential election and just starting to see unleashed what the Trump administration could do. And, you know, the, um, from, uh, from uh, uh, the wall, which has been, you know, thankfully kind of um, um, hasn't uh, been pushed forward as much as it has had promised in the beginning, 
we've still seen amazing um, exclusionary uh, tactics that have been actually written into law and thinking about the history of America itself and how the treatment and incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans in 1942, you know, we have these precedents and they can come back. Um, specifically looking at this photograph from Dorothea Lange, uh, which was taken in Oakland, California in 1942. This focuses on a photograph of a Japanese American uh, business uh, owner who put this sign up in front of their shop right after the, um, the, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And it was a way to also, you know, try to kind of claim his space. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't work in the sense that he too was um, taken away and uh, sent to the internment camps. Um, the, in trying to think about how to pull this image forward, um, I worked on a large scale uh, cotton uh, textile panel in which I reversed uh, the black and white quality of his sign. Uh, made it very large, but then also contracted the word American as if it was a kind of retraction of a promise or a, um, you know, a truncation of, uh, of the notion of citizenship. So I am an is hangs as a wall divider in this case, or as a room divider so that you can walk around it, but it physically um, uh, sort of uh, breaks the space uh, on a diagonal. And you, you're not allowed to kind of open it up and it's physically um, shortened. So in some cases, uh, people have found it difficult to read or they wonder, um, you know, what it says. And then, you know, I think lastly, and I think I'm going to end here, which, you know, sort of shortens the talk, but um, this image uh, also went along with the exhibition. It's called Total Transparency Filter Portrait of N. And this again was my attempt to create a portrait of somebody who is, was essentially unphotographable. So um, this is a, uh, it's a digitally printed uh, a sheer piece of fabric that has been uh, uh, draped over an undocumented individual. And this is somebody that I worked with as when uh, she was a student at UC Berkeley. And, you know, with, with um, the kind of promise uh, of being a dreamer and entering into college and also this notion that she was protected, you know, in uh, to pursue um, her college uh, degree, but then suddenly having that promise rescinded, I wanted to create a space uh, or a kind of um, a presence for her, but in a way that also um, reflected the notion that she either could be removed at any moment but also that maybe by this covering, it's, it's a protection as well, because, you know, you can't identify her features. And again, this question of like, you know, how do you represent somebody at a time in which the representation itself can be very fraught? Um, it's a question that keeps coming up in different ways. And, you know, as an artist of color, I think a lot too about all the ways in which I do and I don't have control over my own representation and how sometimes what I represent can, uh, can change depending on the convenience of the viewer or the conven convenience of the context. And um, in this case, what I'd also like to share about this work is that, you know, when I work with other people, I, uh, I really try to, um, this is not something that I profit off of. Um, the, the sales from images like this go towards um, directly to supporting either nonprofit orgs that I decide on with the sitter themselves, or in this case of uh, Portrait of N, the, the, uh, the monies go towards um, her project, which is uh, filming, making a film of undocumented individuals. So, you know, the, it's also something to consider, I think, in terms of, you know, when one makes political work, like how much does one want to either, you know, um, uh, not profit off of it and actually, you know, use the funds for a much larger purpose. And it, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, really. So I, I, there's one more project I'll wrap up with, and that's the chroma key, um, uh, aftermath series and I guess it's a it's a good way to end just simply because of my background my physical background here as well so along with um, the I am an I am Anne banner and the citizens uh, project chroma key aftermath one is a restaging and reconstruction of some of the um, the 
the, the scenes of protest after all the street battles had been finished and after everyone had left. So in attending the protests and then also seeing the aftermath of it and the, the flags and sticks and barriers and rocks and other sort of like homemade weapons that had been left behind, um, I reconstructed um, uh, portions of it using all uh, chroma key green fabrics uh, and then uh, restage these uh, these sort of scenes. And you know, for me, it functions as a way too to think about how the media and thinking about sort of like the left or the right, you know the the twisting of the uh, of, and the conflation of them as being equals in some way, the blurring of those boundaries between, say, fascists and anti-fascists was something that i I can't uh, I can't sit with. And so chroma key aftermath is definitely a, um, a reference to kind of the, the mediated space in which we have little control over how, how we are represented. And I think I'm gonna end it there actually so I can take questions. But um, if, uh, hi, Ting. Stephanie, thank you so much for this incredibly rich lecture and for sharing your process and thinking with us. Um, We'll now be taking questions for 10 to 15 minutes. And if you would like to ask your question by video chat, just write your name in the chat. And if you'd prefer to ask your question in the chat and have it read aloud, simply type it in. And we will take questions as they come until we're out of time. So the first one is from Rebecca. Can you talk about the open source publications you've created over the years, particularly to assist young artists navigating their art practices as professional artists? Sure, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so I also, I, I have a whole section of my practice, which is, um, I, I like to refer to as creating platforms in some way, or especially pedagogical tools. So whether that's databases or, um, you know, collections of resources. And in this case, I think you're, you're um, asking about a publication called 54 Perspectives. And that was a, a crowdsourced document, which asked uh, working artists about, um, uh, advice that they would give to uh, new new graduates and it was a kind of reality check because as a teacher myself you know there's only so much I think of like professional practices I can um, or we as professors can you know share with students but what happens after this after school and all the ways in which um, you know young artists are much more creative about what their uh, what the reality can be. That's something that I wanted reflected on a wider scale. So if it's 54 Perspectives, it's a publication that's online. Um, it's completely authored by other people. I just collected these um, uh, resources and references and you can download it as a PDF on my website. So uh, we don't, I don't think we have any other questions yet in the chat. Oh, there we go. Uh, from AR, how do you balance working with slash inside institutions with working to dismantle or disrupt them through your art? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I did not touch on, um, so I, I ended my talk early, which is unfortunate because I, I talked too much about some earlier things, but I was gonna move towards uh, showing some projects in which um, they were purposely outside of the, the quote unquote, you know, recognizable art world. Because I do think that um, if this, if your question is related also to this notion of the difference between say like art and politics and where they intersect and where our responsibilities are as an artist, I actually think uh, very strongly that, um, that activism in politics can and should happen apart from art making that you know they can in other words like um if i think about my professional career as an artist in which i have to make art and i have to show them in gallery spaces and i have to kind of you know uh, present them in that way that's been one way of working and then i have a whole parallel other practice in which in some cases i'm anonymous or i work collectively or collaboratively or I feel like I step forward as, as uh, simply a kind of civic person or citizen, you know, in order to do the work. So one, um, 
so in terms in thinking about working inside institutions can you ask me a little bit more about that oh how about this the, okay i see this other part here with working to dismantle disrupt them through your art i don't know if we can dismantle or disrupt institutions in the ways that we want to um fully and that's not to say that we shouldn't try, but I also have very limited goals sometimes about what I think my art within an institution is going to accomplish. And I think that's just my own um, reality check. So uh, in my own practice, there are times where I also try to think about where the, the, the capital goes, right? So if I sell certain artworks and yet there's always a clause that all profits from that work go somewhere else it's kind of like hopefully you know harvesting some of the capital or the funds from one situation to put into another um again that's not disrupting the system at all but it's it's trying to take advantage of some of the um the ways in which systems sometimes can have a kind of um circular logic about them and not uh uh um and not uh, put their resources outside of that circulation. Uh, okay. Um, we have another question from Elliot. You point at a lot of problematic reference points for the Western gaze and standards of our shared mediated images. Is there a space for image making that can exist apart from the canon or is everything a hybrid space now? Huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I, so there is a way, I think, to sort of flip things, and that's literally to flip who gets access to making images, you know, and circulating them. So I think, um, you know, whether it's like, if you, especially the history of photography, which is so fraught, right, with the kind of politics of who had access to the image making, as well as who had access to take photos of other peoples and then position them in a larger kind of narrative you know, whether that was like ethnographic photography or, you know, even now would say, you know, news media and the ability to kind of frame things. Um, it's, you know, what, what heartens me is like, sometimes I can tell who, you know, like very slight uh, sort of shifts in an image based on who is taking or presenting that image. So again, that doesn't necess necessarily solve the problem of the power dynamics, but I do think there is a space for image making that can exist apart from the canon. Uh, and yes, everything is a hybrid space now, but maybe that opens up some ruptures for, you know, who gets to author or reauthor maybe. And from Christina, can you talk a little more about how you think of neutral gray in photographic process versus how you think about the idea of neutrality outside of color correction? Yeah, yeah. I, so, you know, it, originally I was thinking about neutral gray, which again is this sort of like, it's the, the perfect gray that if you have that somewhere in your image, everything else will kind of like pop into, you know, into perfect, uh, whatever that may be. And um, the, that's also, neutral gray is also a kind of middle point between like polarities of say black and white. And so I was thinking about neutral gray as this moment in which um, if when you also have, um, what is it, uh, the, the neutral gray spray paint, which is, oh, primer, primer gray is similar. Primer gray is, a, is the color in which you cover something else with it in order to maybe color it something else later. So it's this sort of like in between liminal space. And the, and so thinking about it in terms of photographic process versus uh, how you think about the idea of neutrality outside of color correction. I've recently started doing projects in which the neutral gray itself has been uh, shifted or flipped. Unfortunately, I didn't, um, I wasn't able to show those works, but it changes everything else around it. And the idea too of it being neutral is completely false. Like I love it that it's called neutral, but it's, you know, it's not, it, it corrects everything around itself. Ooh, so I, so since there isn't another question yet, I actually want to slip one in myself. Um, 
As an artist who works with archival research in the US, I'm curious if you've ever experienced a project being hindered by the limited documentation and records of Asian peoples in this country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, the, I guess I, I really should have talked to about the project, the Smithsonian research that I was doing because, um, so the fellowship that I applied for, for the Smithsonian Museum of American History or the National Museum of American History was to look specifically at colonial era photographs of either uh, Philip, the Philippines or Filipino Americans um, in the entire American, you know, catalog in the museum. And so it turns out after almost two months of research that there is paltry and scant representation. And obviously that's a reflection of the, arch the, the, arch the structure of the archive itself, right? Like who puts those images together, who selects them and who also prioritizes what. And so instead of thinking that, um, uh, what, that nothing happened, you know, regarding Filipinos and Filipino Americans or even Asian, Asian or Asian Americans in relationship to America. It's been really, uh, what was interesting is I started to look at the, the spaces in which they should have been in and then focus on the, the, the blank areas. Because, um, you know, again, like it's gonna take a while to catch up to whoever's curating those archives to start including these things. But it, it, what shocked me about it was how completely invisible, uh, yeah, the history of, of Filipino Americans or Filipinos or even Asian Americans are in that larger narrative. But maybe also weirdly enough, it's, it's a, a possibility for a kind of invention of what we wind up inserting into that archive because uh, a lot of the ethnographic photographs in American archives are incredibly violent and demeaning. You know, they were taken from the perspective of the power structure. And that's great that they're in there, I guess, you know, because it's evidence of those realities. But when they carry forward, they still create a kind of uh, visual trauma that, that locks in uh, you know, uh, a kind of Asian identity into only being that representation. So that's a that's a kind of complicated answer, but um, that's been my observations. So I just typed the last question call since it's after eight, um, but it doesn't seem like anyone has typed anything yet. Uh, but maybe since actually, you know, this is a good opportunity, you were just saying earlier that you were still like getting to grips with Zoom. So in order to thank you for your time and for making the work that you do, I'm hoping I can cajole everyone into doing a really dorky like Zoom standing ovation by putting those clap emojis on your pictures. And then it can, we can really show Stephanie the power of Zoom by everyone putting those little reactions on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know if everyone's doing it yet. Here, I'll do it. Bloop. Clapping. <laughs> um, oh, one last question. Are you okay to go for one more question? Oh, two more, even. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, since Elliot has one, I'll, I'll move the order a bit. Sorry, Elliot. Is there, also Elliot's my coworker, so please know that I'm not just being mean to someone. Uh, is there ever a difference between the work you feel compelled to make and the work you feel responsible for making? If so, how do you navigate this? Ooh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, between the work you feel compelled to make and the work you feel responsible, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of artists are thinking about this right now because, um, so yeah, when March, hit, when, when the pandemic hit, um, I'm gonna just use the pandemic as an example, even though there are you know, many other instances politically in the last four, four and longer years, you know, in which maybe we've all grappled with what we should be making or what we should be doing. So when the pandemic hit in March, I was on a residency in New Orleans at the Joan Mitchell um, uh, center. And I was just starting to produce a massive body of new work, which had to do with the Smithsonian archives. And it was, it, you know, the direction on it was like super strong. And then the pandemic hit. And then Black Lives Matter protests, you know, came to the forefront. And I've had to think about, you know, did the work 
how was the work that I was completely on track to do, you know, moving forward, is it still, is it applicable given all the kind of ruptures that have had, that have happened? And it took me a couple months to figure that out. And in the two, in the, for two months after the pandemic, I wound up sewing uh, uh, um, face masks full time. I actually decided to put all quote unquote artwork making aside in order to, uh, I, I wound up sewing almost um, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 face masks to donate to um, unhoused communities, undocumented folks, and um, nonprofit orgs that um, were supporting uh, black and brown organizations that needed um, you know, face masks because they, they were so hard to get. And um, yeah, and I, I'm still grappling with it a bit, except I do understand that what we're, we're, we're right now politically going through the effects of hundreds of years of inequity on many different levels. And if I can identify that there are portions of my work that are somehow bringing that to light, I hope that it adds into, you know, both the kind of philosophical and, our, and also artistic discussion. But at the same time, I, I am trying to balance it also with what I would consider like work on the ground. And so that's the thing, those are the invisible things that I do to try to make sure that other people are also given voices outside of, you know, this art context, which honestly is, you know, just very sort of um, circular. So, uh, yeah, I, I wish, I wish we lived under a different political reality because I would love to see my own artwork do what I wanted it to do. But I do feel pressure, you know, not, not from ex external factors, but I just personal ones, you know, to kind of like give attention to what's actually happening. And our last question is, um, what have you had to change about your pedagogy pending our current situation? Yeah, I think just practically, um, well, interestingly, so I'm teaching an advanced sculpture class. Uh, well, two classes in the fall. One is advanced sculpture. Now it's just going to be called post-studio practice. And, you know, the, we're, we're just going to have to, like, assess what everyone has access to, you know, because they're zooming in probably from all across the world. And then we're going to, you know, figure out uh, uh, pr projects to work on from there. But I think most importantly, I'm teaching a uh, professional practices class for seniors, uh, senior undergraduates at UC Berkeley. And usually what I've been teaching them in the past is the kind of standard, you know, professional navigation. And I think what I, how I'd like to approach it now is through this notion of like building from the ground up, right? Like if the structures, the, 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 the institutional structures did not exist the way they did now, what would we like to see them as? Because I think in the past artists have been sort of, you know, even though we need to be, uh, we, ha we should have the skills to interface with the institutions as they are, we have been less encouraged to either dismantle them or think about their sort of systematic re-envisioning. And we may have that opportunity now, even though it might be fleeting. So that's probably the biggest thing that has changed, um, less about technology, but more about like, you know, where, where can we, we re-begin? Well, Speaking of beginnings, like having you as our first talk of this semester, no matter how it goes, like this is such a fantastic start. And thank you so much for giving us your time and energy. And again, for just making the work that you do. And so I guess this is like the end of the lecture. So people might start signing off. But um, if you want to like put the little clap emoji up again, super anticlimactic emoji reaction. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I have to say this is really weird to, I'm used to speaking in public in which I can actually, you know, see people and engage and, and it's, it actually can be quite performative uh, group wise. So I appreciate everybody uh, being passive, uh, passive uh, viewers. Nice to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Stephanie will follow up with you. <laughs>